Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about aerial defense. Now, as technology has advanced, a given country has quite a lot of options for defending against aerial targets. From classic, old-school, manned anti-aircraft guns, to automated anti-aircraft guns, to missile batteries, to hypersonic missiles, and relatively soon we'll probably be seeing lasers and railguns for aerial defense. And of course, a given country will have fighters and interceptors that they can scramble into the air for a little bit of air-to-air -air combat. But back in the olden days, in addition to those manned anti-aircraft guns, which would vary considerably from single-gun machine gun turrets to multi-gun cannon turrets, and also a given country's fighters and interceptors, there would be a combination of rudimentary and or seldom used future technology, and also simplistic technology of the previous era. From early guided and unguided rocket and missile systems in the former, and barrage balloons in the latter. From Germany's Fliegerfaust to a blimp attached to a steel cable. Quickly looking at both of these, the Fliegerfaust looked like a minigun barrel, but it would fire a cluster of rockets at low-flying ground attack aircraft. A few of these were made and used before the war ended, and their overall effectiveness was likely minimal. The barrage balloons, on the other hand, were literally just blimps attached to the earth with a steel cable. These cables could destroy low-flying aircraft, just cutting right through them, and the blimps themselves acted as obstacles. These two, their effectiveness wasn't that great, really, but they were very simple to use. But for a country that was on the edge of defeat, with allied fighter and bomber formations flying high overhead constantly, you would need a bit more than just your normal fighters and anti-aircraft guns, or something like the Fliegerfaust. You would need to take some kind of extreme measures, and if possible, it would be ideal to take out multiple enemy aircraft in a single strike. And if you didn't have a really, really, really big shotgun that fired the equivalent of anti-aircraft buckshot, you would need to find something else. That something else is our subject for today, an emergency weapon concept from Germany late in World War II that, in theory, would be able to take out several enemy bombers in a single strike. This is the Sombold SO-344, along with the Blomenvoss P-214, the Junkers Ju-268, and more. The story of this general concept begins in the latter stages of World War II, with Germany increasingly on the defensive and fighting along multiple fronts against the combined power of the United States, the Soviets, Britain, and more. The ever-encroaching Allied forces, the ever-moving front lines, and the ever-present Allied bomber formations over Germany increasingly made Germany incredibly desperate. This led to all manner of emergency projects, from super weapons like the V1 and V2 projects, to the Heinkel HE-162, probably the most successful German emergency fighter, to the Bakum BA-349 Natter, to the Arado E-318, to just about everything and anything in between. A good number of these emergency projects and emergency fighters were rocket and jet-powered fighters and interceptors, designed to repel the onslaught of Allied bombers, and they were armed very often with high-caliber cannons. But there were many a project that went down different offensive routes. Famously, something like the BA-349 Natter had a nose full of unguided rockets that it would shotgun blast at bombers, before gliding or parachuting back down to Earth. Less famously, specially designed aerial ramming aircraft were proposed, like the Zeppelin Rammer that would have a steel wing that would ideally cut through enemy bombers and hopefully survive the exchange. Even less famously, though, were planes like the SO-344 and P-214, 
which would effectively attack using airburst explosives. Airburst weaponry is exactly what it sounds like, an explosive charge that explodes while it's still in the air instead of when it makes contact with some kind of surface. This kind of charge can have several benefits. It can be used for anti-personnel explosives, to spray shrapnel over a wide area, it can be used to have the explosive force impact a wider area, not being impeded by a surface that it would strike, and at least in the case of nuclear explosives, it can be used to limit radioactive fallout. In the case of planes like the SO-344, the intent of the airburst explosive would be the second example benefit, to have the explosion impact an overall greater area. The general concept in principle was relatively simple, but in execution it would be quite the complex affair. If successful though, Germany would be able to take down multiple large multi-engine bombers in a single blow. The airburst defensive aircraft, whatever its design ended up being, would carry some kind of rocket-propelled, gliding, and or guided explosive, and more than likely that explosive would have some kind of proximity fuse attached. The aircraft would then aim at an area of the opposing bomber formation, and that area would be an empty space in between multiple aircraft. Targeting that empty space, the payload would then be fired towards that spot, and ideally when it was equidistant to all of the aircraft surrounding it, the payload would then explode, damaging and hopefully destroying several enemy bombers. In practice, actually successfully doing this would be incredibly difficult, given the presence of enemy escort fighters, and given that their aiming of these payloads was almost guaranteed to be not that precise, meaning that achieving the maximum possible damage would probably only come about by a stroke of sheer luck. Nevertheless, though, the prospect of taking out multiple birds with one stone was incredibly enticing, and so multiple designers and companies would propose these sort of airburst interceptors. We'll start with probably the least viable and probably the most interesting looking concept in the Sombold SO-344. Designed by Heinz Sombold, who, at least apparently up to that point, had made a small name for himself designing gliders, the SO-344 began its career in late 1943, not as this airburst interceptor, but rather just as a parasite fighter. The initial concept was that the SO-344 would reside under wing or under fuselage on a German bomber, and when enemy fighters approached, or the bomber approached an enemy formation, the SO-344 would release and attack enemy aircraft with its pair of machine guns or cannons. But since the war situation was deteriorating, in early 1944, Sombold significantly altered the design of the SO-344 to better fit in with the emergency defensive situation Germany was now in. Measuring in at just 7 meters long, 5.7 meters wide, and 2.18 meters tall, the SO-344 was an incredibly small and simply made fighter. Largely made out of wood, its small size and lightweight building materials made for a very light gross weight of just 2,976 pounds. Up in the nose would be what appeared to be at first glance additional horizontal and vertical surfaces, as if the SO-344 was a canard wing fighter of some kind. This entire nose section was actually the fighter's explosive payload, an 880-pound rocket outfit with a proximity fuse, and at the pilot's discretion, the nose would fire off from the rest of the plane and explode when triggered by its fuse. Just behind the nose would be a secondary armament in the upper nose cowling, if you want to call it that, of two machine guns or cannons, the actual caliber of them is not listed. 
these would be used for further attacking enemy formations after the main rocket was spent. Back in the very crowded tail would be the pilot and cockpit, the horizontal and vertical tail surfaces, and the exhaust for the plane's propulsion. Likely located around the middle of the plane was a Walter 509 rocket engine, which fired under the cockpit and out of the end of the tail. Enough fuel was on board for about 25 minutes of flight, and once all of that fuel was spent, the SO-344 would have to glide back down to Earth and hopefully survive landing on its built-in rounded landing skids. Owing to the design's bizarre and pretty unique attack method, it didn't exactly gain the favor of the Luftwaffe and Reich Air Ministry, and the project would only advance as far as a small wind tunnel tester model before it was abandoned. And realistically, even if the SO-344 had been made, it's unlikely that it would have been effective. The 880-pound rocket would have been very difficult to use as it was intended, and the fact that the SO-344 had to be carried into the air by a parent aircraft further reduced its potential effectiveness. The parent plane would be left incredibly vulnerable when carrying it, and it's very likely that it would be shot down before it could deploy the SO-344. Still, though, the whole airburst bomber destroyer concept was nevertheless appealing to other designers and companies, but instead of making the equivalent of what looked like an uncapped marker, these other companies generally tried to use the Mistel concept, which was similar to the Parasite Fighter concept, but a little bit simpler, I guess. In these Mistel aircraft, generally speaking, a higher power fighter was used as the parent plane, and underneath it, an unmanned gliding explosive or explosive-laden airframe would be attached. While most Mistel aircraft used in the Second World War, the relatively few that were used, that is, were used for attacking ground targets, some of them were proposed to attack bombers as these airburst weapons. One such design was the Blomenvoss P-214. Proposed towards the end of 1944, this, by Blomenvoss's standards anyway, relatively normal design, doesn't have a ton of concrete information on it, but from what does exist, it may have perhaps been more effective than the SO-344 in theory. The parent plane was to be a rather small, of unspecified length and 6 meters wide jet-powered fighter, and in the nose would be a pilot lying in the prone position. Underneath, an 8-meter-long explosive charge would be carried, and it too would be powered by some kind of jet propulsion system. With a 2,200-pound charge, the P-214 would have nearly three times the destructive potential as the SO-344, and instead of being a parasite fighter, the P-214 would sit on a detachable dolly and would be towed into the air by another German bomber. At the very least, this left the P-214 about equally as vulnerable as the SO-344. While this overall design was probably better than the SO-344, at the very least due to the increased destructive potential, it too was not pursued and advanced no further than the drawing board. This was because the development of the design was projected to last into 1947, and Germany needed weaponry right now, not three years down the line. And for some potentially more readily available anti-bomber Mistel planes, proposals like the Junkers Ju-268, Arado E-377, Junkers Ju-287 Mistel, and Messerschmitt Me-262 Mistel all used existing aircraft for their parent planes, and at least in the latter two, used the frames and designs of existing aircraft for their payloads. The Ju-268 would likely utilize the Heinkel He-162 as the parent plane, 
and the JU-268 itself, the name for the unmanned wooden frame payload, would have two jet engines sitting under wing, both BMW-3s for its own propulsion. But the proposed payload would be the strongest yet, ranging from 4,400 pounds up to 7,700 pounds. While this would be the strongest yet, the fact that it would have to use and sacrifice two valuable jet engines for one explosive charge meant that it likely would have been more trouble than it was really worth. And for all of these as well, it should go without saying that actually aiming and using these weapons effectively would have been very difficult. For the E-377, it too would likely utilize the HE-162, and in a different configuration, it would use the Arado AR-234 jet bomber. This design as well would also utilize a pair of jet engines for its own thrust, and its payload sat at a respectable 4,400 pounds. But much like the Ju-268, the fact that it sacrificed two jet engines realistically made it too wasteful to seriously consider. Lastly, for the Ju-287 Mistel and the Me-262 Mistel, each of them used stripped-down or scaled-down frames of the planes that they were named after, with the Ju-287 Mistel using the overall Ju-287 design for the shape of its explosive, and the Me-262 Mistel doing the exact same with the Me-262. With respective bomb loads of 8,800 pounds and upwards of 13,000 pounds, both designs were quite powerful. And you also may be wondering why the Ju-287 design had a smaller payload, but it at least appeared to have a bigger frame. That was because the Ju-287 used four jet engines for its own propulsion, and it had a lot of fuel to go with it. It should be rather safe to say that this 287 project was likely to be used as a long-range Mistel airburst weapon. However, the 287 version sacrificed four jet engines instead of just two, making it clearly the most wasteful of these anti-bomber airburst Mistels. And as should come to nobody's surprise, neither of these projects were pursued. So, for Germany's limited line of airburst bomber-destroying weapons, while they would have been pretty enticing weaponry if everything went exactly as planned, taking out several big birds with one stone, actually doing so probably would have involved luck far, far more than actual skill. But I guess for Germany to actually turn the tide of the war, they needed a lot of luck and maybe some kind of divine intervention. So realistically, these airburst weapons kind of fit in with what their situation was. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, recently I've been playing the game Hades, and I went into it with absolutely no knowledge about what the game was, other than what was on the cover, really. And it's actually a great game. It's a roguelite where you play as the son of Hades, and you're trying to escape the underworld to meet and talk to your mother. Not only is the gameplay really good, but the actual story and writing of the game is surprisingly solid. Like, you'd imagine that a roguelite game probably wouldn't really care about what the narrative is. Absolutely do pick up the game if you get the chance, though. It's a few years old at this point, so it's probably pretty cheap. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.